not only uh, non-governmental organizations, but also uh, institutions like the Council of Europe uh, and uh, others, uh, and also multi-stakeholder uh, coalitions uh, trying to tackle this uh, issue with the understanding that human rights apply online as uh, they uh, apply and as we uh, understand them uh, offline. And we have uh, had uh, since then quite a number of initiatives or charters to try to uh, understand or even I would say to translate human rights as we know them, as they are defined in the uh, Universal Declaration on, on Human Rights, how to translate them online. What does that mean? Uh, what these uh, rights uh, mean uh, online? How we could exercise them? How we could effectively realize them? And among the number of initiatives uh, that uh, try to tackle this issue, I can mention uh, the APC, Association for Progressive Communication uh, Charter and Human Rights Project, and we will have the opportunity to um, uh, talk about that and explain this project with the representative of the APC, which is on the panel uh, with us, Joy Lidicott. Uh, there uh, have been, of course, uh, academic uh, work uh, on, on, on this and uh, also um, the Council of Europe as, a, as an institution have undertaken uh, the, I would say, a kind of institutionalization of uh, these uh, initiatives and more, most recently the Council of Europe have set up a group of experts uh, um, in charge of uh, working of, on a compendium of uh, internet uh, user rights uh, in, with the objective to give uh, citizens uh, a practical means to understand their rights and to uh, try to uh, have uh, remedies uh, in case of violation of their rights when they are when they they use uh, the the internet and um, another of our panelists uh, Wolfgang Benedek who is a law professor at the University of Graz of Graz in uh, Austria will tell us uh, more about this uh, kind of in initiative this also builds on the work of the uh, IGF D Dynamic uh, Coalition on Internet uh, Rights and Principle, which has developed uh, a charter taking all the fundamental rights as they are defined in the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and translating them uh, or in the, the, the online uh, environment. And this charter is uh, a, basis, a basic resource for, the, uh, for us in the coalition to build up more practical initiative, one of them having been the uh, 10 internet rights and principles that you can find on the uh, IRP uh, coalition uh, website. And Wolfgang is a, is a member of, uh, of this coalition uh, as well. Then uh, we, uh, even if we um, uh, achieve su such work of translating human rights in the online environment and uh, finding a practical way that we would like to find as, a, as an internet user, we can do nothing, we cannot implement this and realize uh, this rights if we don't have, if we don't benefit from the cooperation of other stakeholders that are essential for some of them uh, are essential intermediaries uh, when we use the internet. And to discuss this uh, uh, with them, we have uh, um, two um, panelists. W uh, one uh, is uh, Marco Pancini, who is a senior policy counsel uh, uh, with Google and thus uh, present the online services on, on this panel. And we will have also uh, Michael uh, uh, Rotert, who is the honorary sp uh, spokesperson of the European Association of Internet Service uh, Providers, who are the real technical intermediaries for all our activities on the internet. 
last but not least, especially since uh, human rights, it is the duty of uh, governments to uh, uh, ensure uh, for their citizens the um, uh, the protection of uh, and the, the true exercise of uh, human rights. This is the duty of the state. And we have also, as a, one of our panelists, Michael, um, uh, sorry, Matthias uh, Treimer, who is the head of uh, Department of Media Affairs and Information Society with the Federal Chancellery in uh, Austria. He also represents the uh, intergovernmental uh, uh, group of, uh, of states with the, with the Council of Europe. Our last uh, panelist is uh, Amelia Anders Dotter. She is a member of the European Parliament. Uh, elected from the Swedish Pirate uh, Party, and we uh, would have been very keen to have uh, uh, her inputs in this panel, but uh, I'm afraid she cannot confirm her participation, and uh, maybe she could join us uh, later if she, if she appears. Otherwise, I will um, give the floor very quickly to uh, each of uh, our panelists just to introduce more their, themselves in terms of the uh, main issues that they would like to discuss um, in the framework of this panel, and then uh, each one of them will, uh, will get a specific question from the... Uh, would you like to start, please, Joy? Thank you. Thanks, Mariam. Uh, greetings, everybody. Uh, I thought perhaps just to give some context for uh, the range of tools, if you would call them that, human rights tools that uh, we currently have might be useful. And then perhaps just to ask some questions that we might be able to discuss. Um, and Miriam, you, in a way you've, you've already outlined um, in a very broad way, the, the vast number of documents, initiatives, um, coalitions uh, that have developed around internet rights and principles. Um, I mean, the APC Charter, was developed uh, in the late 1990s, um, really came from a move out of the movement of the communication rights where activists were trying to articulate the kinds of rights that they had offline and their application online. Um, uh, since then, and, and even before, but since then we've seen the kind of a blossoming and a flowering with many, many different uh, kinds of similar initiatives. And I think that, that, in a way, these are all the same tools. The, the tools are human rights. The way in which people give expression to those rights, the, the motivations which drive the particular moments in time um, that, that they reach for them are different. But the, essentially, the same thing is happening, that uh, rather than protecting users, what people are asking for is to protect their rights. Uh, and, and we see this in different contexts. Even traditionally, the private sector, which has said, you know, human rights are not, are not, they're the field of public policy, they're not relevant to us, um, has started to articulate human rights principles. Um, for example, the Global Network Initiative, um, looking at human rights in business. Um, we've seen governments also taking human rights principles into ICANN. For example, the Government Advisory Committee has a set of principles which they've developed, um, uh, and non-commercial users in ICANN have done so as well. Uh, so I think the key question for us is not not which uh, which sets of, 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 of principles uh, you know are the right ones or how they might be coalesced, but rather what are the reasons why people are reaching for rights as leverage in internet public policy? What are the issues that we're confronting that drive us to focus on uh, the right to security, uh, freedom from uh, you know unreasonable search and seizure? Um, you know, prohibitions on filtering internet content, um, you know, harassment of online blogs and so on. And how does that shape and drive the, the future of where these human rights and principles documents are going? Thank you. Thank you. We will certainly get back to all this issue. Uh, Wolfgang, may I ask you very shortly on the main objective uh, for you uh, in, in such kind of work? Thank you very much, Miriam, and thank you all for coming for that workshop and participating in it. Um, I think there is no shortage of declarations which talks about the empowerment of the users. 
But when you look at practice, uh, then this empowerment uh, does not really exist. Uh, for example, what you sign every day or what you tick every day is uh, that I have read the terms of service and I agree with them. And certainly you have not read them, you simply have to agree to them because you have no choice, you have no alternative, you have no options. And uh, the question is about this imbalance of power uh, between quasi-monopolies or between the state and uh, the individual user, uh, which finds it increasingly difficult uh, to uh, have its rights respected. And here the issue is about human rights of internet users. So these uh, human rights are usually public, uh, internationally supported rights towards governments, but increasingly it has been recognized, as Miriam said, uh, that these rights are also to be respected uh, by the private sector. And the RAGI principles, the RAGI framework um, confirms that uh, there is uh, such an obligation also on companies, and companies usually do not deny that. The issue is how to operationalize now this obligation, how to make it work for the users. And here the issue is about what could be possible avenues in this respect. Uh, when it comes uh, to the issue um, of state intervention, we can talk about this blocking and filtering or the requests for disclosure of information or we can talk about other things. When it comes uh, to the question of companies, uh, we can uh, talk about, for example, the role of ISPs, as they're here on the table also. There's a lot of pressure on them and uh, to uh, fulfill certain expectations. And uh, in that, they should also be supported and protected uh, in, uh, by human rights, not to act against them. What we see in practice often is a lack of due process. Uh, whether this is copyright or libel accusations. Uh, we see also overreactions, a lack of proportionality when it comes, for example, to child protection. And this goes to the detriment of freedom of, uh, freedom of expression. So the issue is also the balancing in the right way. Now, what are the remedies in this respect? And uh, you can go to court, but court is quite cumbersome, time consuming. If you go to the European Court of Human Rights, it can take four, five, six years. So it's not really an effective remedy uh, for the problems. Uh, what else could be done? And this is the question here. Should we use competition law? Should the European Union get more active? They have actually promised to do this. Um, for example, in the context of new proposals on pa data protection, in the context of the Council of Europe, we see a number of guidelines and codes uh, on human rights, how they should be implemented uh, by social networks, uh, by search engines, etc. Also in the context of the Council of Europe, the revision, the modernization of Convention 108 on data protection, so there is a number of issues or of processes going on. Still, the issue is now we have all these rights, or they, the users are claiming, are given these rights, uh, like, for example, access to the information which is held on you, uh, the right to correct and delete information which is on you, held on you, to discard search results, to be able to withdraw your consent, etc. But in practice, this is uh, often not working. And so the question is, what are possible new ways um, to uh, strengthen user rights or how to strengthen existing procedures um, in order to make user rights a reality? And I could say a little bit more on that later.
Thank you, Wolfgang. We will have time to enter even more into uh, uh, details on this uh, discussion. But as for now, I would like uh, uh, you you mentioned the private sector and the uh, in intermediaries. I would like to ask uh, uh, Michael uh, Rothart for the the objectives of uh, the ISP uh, in such a, a work. Would the uh, are they keen to uh, cooperate with such a work? Do they see an interest for them, uh, even when they are not forced by uh, governments or by some legislation uh, to uh, I implement some, uh, some activity? Please, uh, Michael, could you give us your understanding of uh, this object? <coughs> well, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Miriam. Um, Internet service providers do a lot without being forced by anybody, but um, they cannot be and should not be considered to be deputies for either um, consumers or law enforcement. Uh, for instance, um, what we have done in a ver very early stage is the human rights guidelines for Internet service providers, especially. and. The way we handled um, these guidelines, which were worked out together with the Council of Europe, um, that is, um, we asked um, as association our members if they can sign off uh, this paper and, of course, act uh, on, on what is in, in this paper. I can tell you it's a hard way, um, and it's not that easy on one side. On the other side, there are a lot of projects coming out um, uh, um, from, from requests from users like uh, complaint hotlines, uh, like hotlines uh, for, uh, well, also for um, human rights uh, <clears throat> questions and, and similar things. Um, but these are uh, much more on country country uh, by country very handled very differently. Some of them have uh, telephone lines where users can uh, uh, place a call. Others have websites where they can put their complaint in. And uh, what exists at the moment beside those guidelines, which are not uh, signed by every uh, ISP uh, in, in, in Europe and, or outside Europe, um, that is, uh, that there exists uh, a network of hotlines, but they are primarily for uh, law enforcement, for child uh, fighting child pornography or, or other uh, unwanted content, uh, so to say, which means it's not directed uh, directly in a first approach on, on human rights issues and on, on uh, but much more on, on law enforcement, but in some countries it has changed a little bit, and the hotlines also take requests from uh, from end users for whatsoever. And I can tell you most of the uh, uh, user requests, and they can complain about human rights issues, about privacy issues, about whatsoever. Most of the complaints are coming about um, unwanted mails, or also called spam where people are, people are complaining about the m huge amount of spam which is still going on. Um, the ISPs are very often uh, uh, named as gatekeepers because th they are somewhere in between, but you have to check when you talk about the ISP industry what sort of ISP you are talking to. An access ISP, that is the internet service provider, who gives you the direct access to the internet has totally different obligations and tools to, to work on than a provider who hosts uh, uh, websites or, or who hosts other content, uh, just to name the, the biggest uh, distinction between uh, providers. So um, whenever we talk about internet service providers, it should also be named on what sort of internet service providers we're talking of, because the tech, technical issues are totally different uh, from the various providers. I can tell you 
um, to come to an end, that we are currently reworking the human, right gu human rights guidelines in order to reflect social networks uh, where they, um, and privacy issues um, uh, and to make them a little bit more practical and hopefully um, that then much, much more internet service providers are signing these human rights guidelines off and uh, treat them uh, or behave whatever is written in here. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. As you said, we have to make difference between um, uh, uh, the different gatekeepers. You mentioned the uh, role of the access provider, which is different from the role of the host provider. But we also have other kind of ca gatekeepers, mainly working as a gatekeepers, a content gatekeepers. And these are, they have emerged uh, and developed with the uh, Web 2.0. And these are the online services. And I would like to get the impression from uh, Marco Mancini uh, representing uh, uh, Google on also this initiative on um, uh, trying to, to translate, to understand human rights and to define and implement some remedies in the online world. Please, Marco. Thank you, Mayem. Thank you, the Council of Europe, for inviting us to speak here today. Um, I will try to bring uh, to your attention some example of things that Google does in order to empower uh, internet users to um, uh, express and to, to find a concrete realization of their, their rights online. Uh, first example, uh, we believe that privacy and security are extremely important for internet users. This is why we provide uh, for all uh, the communication that the internet, exchange, the internet user exchange online uh, secure connection. We know that the internet is a credible tool in order to empower and foster communication. We know as well that the government and um, a lot of interested parties are looking at ways now to improve the surveillance tools of, of internet users. This is why security in terms of a secure internet connection is a, is a way for, for us to offer services that are actually not putting user, user at risk. Another, another example, always on the field of privacy and security, is uh, uh, the double factor identification. We know that uh, in, in, in interception and uh, access to uh, internet to internet user communication, in particular email communication, is a very important issue. Uh, we know a user cares a lot about uh, the security of, of uh, their, their communication. This is why we are offering for all the Gmail account, the, both business and also private Gmail accounts, a second factor identification. The second uh, factor identification make it possible that even if your password is uh, stolen, you can always uh, uh, have uh, this uh, security tool in order to not let anybody to access to your to your G Gmail address. And this uh, in in situation in which, uh, so we are not only talking about uh, possible access uh, for fraud to your to your Gmail account. We are also talking about possible access to your Gmail account in order to apply surveillance surveillance to to your to so we know um, how important this, uh, this can be for, for internet user in, in um, specific uh, countries. Uh, always on the privacy and security, uh, an example uh, of the way we wanted to uh, provide user control over the data is uh, uh, the Google dashboard, is uh, uh, all the tools that we are offering, uh, for example, in order to get back your data if you decide to leave uh, the Google services and then move to other services. Uh, this exercise is called uh, the data liberation front, but uh, in going to, to the nutshell is uh, just uh, to empower users to be able to get back their data and do with their, the, 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 their data when we are talking about email, we are talking about uh, a video posted on YouTube, we are talking about any kind of post, uh, for example on G Plus now, uh, to get them back uh, because they own the content. We don't own the content, the user own the content. Second example uh, of, of tools and ways for Google to help users to um, empower the, 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 the rights online is the transparency. We are a huge believer in transparency. This is why uh, already a few, few years ago we launched the first uh, transparency report, which is a, a way for Google to give uh, full disclosure uh, over the request that we are receiving from government all, ac all across the world to have uh, uh, to receive information about uh, about the user, uh, 
saying that uh, any any pr there is no process uh, of communication of, of user data to uh, law enforcement or to governments which is not following strictly the rule of law at the same time on top of that so on top of the respect of the rule of law we want also to provide full disclosure to the user on how we are handling this request how many requests we are receiving how many requests we are answering Recently, we added another uh, layer in terms of security, which is uh, in terms of transparency. Sorry, which is uh, the uh, transparency report also for the copyright request that we are receiving. Uh, these, together with the possibility for user to make, uh, to give, to provide, uh, to provide their opinion and to make appeal uh, to any kind of decision that Google is taking, uh, also to um, enforce. Uh, right on SIPR rights online is a way for us to provide the transparency and control also on the process to user. Last example was mentioned before is uh, uh, all our activity around the corporate social responsibility area and in particular the GNI, we like to mention the GNI which is the Global Network, Network in Initiative. We believe that the GNI is, is a way to move forward in the direction of improving uh, social responsibility of, uh, of internet um, companies and service provider uh, is a way for us also to discuss uh, uh, issues in a specific jurisdiction, is a way for us to bind ourselves to specific standards in terms of respect of human rights in, in uh, specific uh, countries where this is needed. And again, we believe that this is an effort that cannot be done alone. We, we are a great believer in multi stakeholderism and this is why the GNI is open to all the different representatives of the, of the ecosystem. Last, last point, uh, it was mentioned again, is the, the Internet Right and Principle exercise of the Charter of Human Rights. This is another good example, in our opinion, of, uh, and probably not well uh, publicized, or that we didn't get enough visibility as it uh, deserves, of uh, coming uh, together with different uh, uh, representatives of uh, interest and discussing some uh, some clear and uh, straight to the point uh, um, principle in order to empower user user rights online. And again, that's not uh, the end of the process. So I'm looking forward actually to discuss about the possible follow-up of, of this uh, this initiative. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. We will also, I hope so. We will also discuss uh, whether this tool and you have uh, mentioned some examples. Uh, from uh, Google side, whether the, these tools are themselves respecting uh, human rights. So this is this will be another part of the discussion. But I would like to to ask also um, the representative of um, the uh, government, uh, the, uh, Matthias uh, Tremer, uh, representing the Austrian government. I would like to ask you whether you see that with the current set of legislation and regulation. Do you think uh, this is enough to uh, really uh, protect uh, uh, human rights and also to allow users to access to remedies, or do you think we still need uh, for more um, uh, tools? Thank you, Miriam. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, well, yes, I'm a civil servant, and in my 18 years of civil servant, that's already my seventh government that I have in front of me, they change and we stay. So I try to explain a little bit of my, my visions that I have so far. Um, government representatives normally at IGFs are some kind of suspicious to the uh, mostly uh, non-governmental representatives and immediately they are linked with restriction, regulation, intervention and so on. But that's not, let's say, the way how, for example, the European Court on Human Rights sees the roles of member states, of governments, um, because the uh, Court on Human Rights says two governments do not only refrain from intervening in your personal human rights spheres, don't just be inactive, but the European Court on Human Rights says to member states, you have to be active, you have to do something that your citizens really can make best use of their human rights. And there we are at a very important point uh, from my point of view. Um, teaching people what are your human rights and making 
them really the feeling, yes, I understand what I can do in a certain situation, is a positive obligation of the state. Now, this can also become a dangerous task when the state is teaching you what rights do you have, because not all states are doing this in the very best mood. But from the ideal field, I would say, um, states really should start asking themselves what have we done for our citizens so far that they know about their rights. I tell you something very simple. Um, we have rights, as w was said, we do not have to reinvent rights for the online world. We have remedies. In most states we have remedies. We all have the problems with the effectiveness of these remedies. Now, why is that? Because when it comes to crucial points, for example, to and crucial points are often the very simple points. Somebody is looking for something on Google. Something is on Facebook. When you ask people out in the streets, and I was doing some interviews for another conference recently, when you ask them, do you know why it is free for you? Most people say, well, it's advertising, or, well, yes, maybe they have some, some commercial interest. Yes, they are right, but very few people know what is happening to their data. And therefore, I think it's very important that this topic, uh, what data, what happens to your data uh, when you, for example, are moving in search machines, is also taken up by the state as an important tool. Last not least, um, it's not only the state, but the state has, should support private initiatives uh, which uh, care for the, let's say, making knowledge to the people of their rights. In Austria we have, for example, very good, um, very good, um, let's say, uh, practices with our internet ombudsman. Um, and the internet ombudsman is a private organization but supported by uh, various ministries of the Austrian government and is working in the network of the Safer Internet Program of the European Union. Not officially supported but idealized by some um, also government people including me, although I love Facebook very much and I am on Facebook, yes, and I use Facebook nearly every day. There is, for example, a young, young Austrian student, he is called Mark Schrems, and he started an initiative which I wouldn't have started it in this hostile way. It's called Europe Against Facebook. But what did he show with his initiative, Europe Against Facebook? He showed that when you give information on Facebook about yourself, you do not know what happens to it. And he wanted to know it from Facebook. And all his attempts were stopped, let's say, at the Irish Data Protection Authority because they said, we do not have really the instruments for it. So these are the ways, the concrete topics we have to talk about when people move on the internet. Academic discussions, I'm an academic as well, but I think we should go more in practice. If, last, let me say this very last sentence. And I may excuse to the organizers of IGF, which I principally really uh, show all my respect. But when do we give up morning sessions like this, these welcoming sessions, with speeches and speeches and speeches we hear every year, taking three or four hours? You, were you watching the people? Nobody was listening. And you had all these representatives. If we had taken the time, three hours or four hours, to go to the public and tell what is IGF about, what does it mean concrete for you, without repeating 20 times a transparent, open, secure internet. This would have been a big step. And that's what we should think about, because otherwise IGF becomes still and stays the same old club. Sorry for that, but I'm, I'm really a little bit, let's say, worried about the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. I couldn't. <laughs> I couldn't agree more with you, but you know, there are some countries, it's, it's an issue with the IGF in general, but also there are some countries where speeches are made not for people to listen. 
because <laughs> it's not about convince and I'm saying this as a Tunisian too so I know what I'm talking about and uh, this is Tunisian and French but we had we have had more problem in Tunisia than in France I have to recognize although uh, France is not a perfect democracy uh, so there are speeches that are just given because there are other uh, means, uh, other coercitive means uh, uh, to exercise of people. And this is the very, uh, uh, our very point in this work and th in this workshop to uh, check at least in the online uh, field how we can have uh, less of this and we have people who really exercise your, your right. Maybe you um, have uh, noticed that this panel is uh, not only European, but mainly European and, uh, and only uh, from the Western world. But we have here the representative from the Association for Progressive Communication, uh, and the association is, is a truly international association. And I would like to uh, have your inputs uh, on whether these issues and these discussions are also taking part in the global uh, south and if they are taking part in the same way as we we discuss them uh, is there i remember yesterday i attended uh, the session organized by apc and uh, and others and i uh, listened to paminder chit singh uh, saying very uh, rightly in, in my opinion uh, that uh, most of the decision, most of uh, the policy decision and the global policy decision are uh, decided in the western part of, of the world and they are exercised on the, the global world and also we have the issue of uh, multinational global companies. We have Google here on the panel, Facebook was mentioned and we have some others. So. Uh, could you give us some uh, feedback uh, from the, the discussions in the Global South on this issue? Then? Sure, thank you. Um, and I think it's, it's very important to remember that only one third of the global population is currently connected to the internet by ITU statistics. So that means two thirds of the global population are not uh, online. And you know, one of the things that keeps me awake at night is the fact that I know that for people coming online for the first time today have less freedom online than those who came online 10 years ago did. Uh, there is so much more interference with and shaping of the online experience now compared to, compared to previously. And my, my worry, and I think particularly from APC perspective, and those in developing countries in the global south which are, uh, are coming online now, the context in which they're thinking about rights and thinking about development is, is vastly different um, from those who are coming online in developing countries. Uh, so I think that's the first thing. And I, and I think also we mustn't forget that our ability to express our rights online is very much um, connected to what's happening offline. So if we have um, countries in which the rule of law uh, offline is not settled, uh, if uh, countries are repressive, anti-democratic, where new forms of democracy are still emerging, I think we need to keep in mind that the right, rights discourse, the way in which rights is being discussed and which they're enforced offline will be quite different from the ways in which um, they're being experienced uh, in the global north. Um, and so I think, uh, yes, there are different conversations uh, for sure. Um, and I think also that uh, the, you know, I mean, I think it's really good to hear about the initiatives that the private sector are taking, um, and I salute those, um, and also the good initiatives from governments. But I think that many users are very frustrated with their ability to, to get remedies for rights violations online. I mean, think about the work that APC does um, with women's human rights defenders, you know, women who are stalked online, um, who are harassed, um, uh, who, you know, where, where violence against them is propagated through the use of ICTs, pictures of them are posted online, and, and they can't get internet intermediaries to act under those intermediaries' own terms of service. Um, so, uh, 
I, I think uh, it's important to, to be honest about the good effect, efforts we're making, but also be realistic about the, the ineffectiveness at times. Um, I mean, other issues in the, in the global south and the developing economies, I think, that, that we're seeing is that um, there is a desire from, um, you know, Latin American countries and, and African countries to participate more in the right to discourse, but their agendas are, are very different. Um, and the, the rights issues which concern them are very different. So, um, you know, I think it would be exciting to see, and we have seen in, in, in African um, contexts, their articulation of rights online. Uh, but I do think we're headed for a crisis of confidence, to be quite honest, um, around uh, internet-related rights issues and the way in which we get remedies for them. Um, I think in the, in the Google context, I'm, I'm a big fan of the, of the Google Transparency Report, but I think if we look at um, countries where Google has national offices, where they're required to be based in country, and subjected to national laws, and as a result, uh, we're seeing content filtering, content interference. I'm thinking in particular about in Pakistan and the recent case of the, of the controversial film, um, which was uh, posted on YouTube, um, and the Pakistan government uh, requested that it be removed. Uh, YouTube refused, and as a result, the government simply blocked YouTube, uh, which completely disrupted the entire Google platform in Pakistan for hundreds of thousands of users. Um, uh, so I think if we think about effective remedies, we need to be thinking how we can be much more collaborative, and I worry, I worry very much, particularly for those in developing countries, that their government's frustration and, and, and um, desire to control offline democratic um, processes is starting to impact very, very severely on, on internet-related um, experiences. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. But um, um, I'm sure this was not your objective, but I think we shouldn't uh, uh, split the world uh, into um, uh, democratic countries and non or so-called democratic countries and so-called non-democratic countries because we are seeing and we have been seeing for years in Europe um, uh, regulation and even legislation which can uh, go against the due process and the rule of law and as a matter of fact Wolfgang uh, mentioned this but uh, Wolfgang I would ask you like to ask you uh, to be um, more uh, pedagogic uh, with us and to explain more maybe with an, uh, uh, an example how uh, some uh, rights could be translated uh, online and let's not talk about freedom of expression because uh, there are, it's, it's very important of course but there are uh, a lot of uh, discussion around this but maybe the right to privacy or the right to a fair trial spe speaking of due process how could this be uh, translated in the, how should we understand this in the online world? And also, are there in the whole set of rights as defined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, should we uh, have a translation for each right? For, in for instance, the right to life, the prohibition uh, from torture, etc. Should we uh, have a translation for each of these rights, or are there some rights that could apply on the on in the online world and others not? Thank you, Miriam. Um, I personally think that most human rights translate somewhere. Uh, also in the online world, and we have uh, checked this uh, in the Dynamic Coalition on Internet Rights and Principles by developing uh, this charter on human rights and principles on the Internet. And we realized that practically all rights of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights can become relevant in some context. Uh, there is not really a need for new rights in that respect. What we need is uh, rather to interpret and to adjust uh, those rights uh, to the online uh, context. And this is also what we hear from the UN Rapporteur uh, on freedom of expression, Frank LaRue, who is also uh, at this IGF. Now, um, when we give ex the look at examples, um, I wanted to come back to Marco, who has uh, given us some example what Google is doing, and I'm sure that Google is uh, living up to its, or trying to live up to its motto, which is uh, practically uh, do no harm, uh, but um, in practice, um, it, I 
is uh, also uh, following, uh, so it's uh, terms of service, uh, method of methods of behavioral tracking, and uh, when we when we uh, uh, agree to these uh, to these terms, uh, we also agree uh, to these uh, methodologies. And um, to give an example, uh, from Germany there is an association of consumers. Uh, which uh, recently has uh, sued uh, Google in front of a court in Berlin uh, for a number of such clauses in the uh, terms of service because they feel that these clauses, leaving this consumer without any choice, uh, may be in violation of uh, the obligations of uh, Google under the uh, contractual law, um, generous and contractual law in uh, Germany. Now. Um, we will see what is the outcome of this, but in any case, uh, the question is, uh, do we have an alternative? Could I, for example, say, okay, I don't want to be tracked, uh, my behavior should, be, uh, should not be uh, recorded, and I'm ready to pay something for the services instead. And so one of the complaints we have had in our committee was uh, from people who said, I'm ready to pay, uh, but I don't have this alternative. It's not given to me uh, by Google. Or if I go to iTunes, uh, Genius is used by some people, maybe also here in the room, and they have similar uh, ways and methodologies, so they offer you the music you might like most, and they say this is in order to improve our services uh, to the consumer. Yes, it could be that, but uh, you have no way to opt out from this. And this is the question, um, whether you have um, this uh, authority, whether you have uh, the possibility of saying, this is my digital identity, this is what I want, and I do not want this kind of services. Um, at the moment, it's very difficult uh, to do that. And then, um, I think uh, Nigel has uh, mentioned a number of activities the ISPs are actually undertaking, and I think this is a, is a good a good move and a very necessary move as well. Um, still, um, the question uh, in that context uh, would be, uh, can we have uh, more of the services in different countries or by the companies themselves? So for example, to give uh, an example of good practice of Germany, so to say, there is a association of ISPs and other business, ECHO, and uh, they have indeed uh, such a, a hotline or helpline where you can address them on all kinds of issues. Uh, this can go from child pornography to spam uh, to problems uh, which you as an internet user are, uh, uh, are confronted with. And I think that is uh, the least what could be done uh, by the responsible and accountable, uh, let's say, businesses uh, to offer uh, such a quick service uh, to the users uh, to address their concerns. Thank you, Wolfgang. This is indeed one of the uh, uh, issues that we, we can explore and discuss uh, more with the uh, um, uh, private sector operating on the internet. Uh, before going ahead with the uh, other panelists and other questions, I would like to uh, open the floor so uh, that we can have some interaction and uh, may I remind you that uh, as I mentioned uh, in the beginning the Council of Europe is, uh, has a, a group of experts which is undertaking the, the writing of uh, this translation of human rights and uh, identifying what are the practical problems of the user and trying to uh, make some proposal on uh, uh, maybe innovative uh, kind of, uh, of remedies. So we would uh, very much uh, welcome uh, your input on this if you have encountered particular problems or you, if you have uh, any solution to propose or of course to discuss what uh, was uh, said already. Uh, we also have uh, um, uh, online moderators. Uh, I don't know if we have any question uh, from uh, the uh, online people who are following us. Um, please uh, mention them. Uh, any question? Yeah. 
please go ahead. Uh, please identify yourself. Hello. Okay, hi. My name is Anas. I am from Syria. And I have two small questions for Google. Uh, one of them is the, the thing that Marco suggested. Actually, it's in Syria, and an another friend from Belarus has men mentioned the same. The um, two, uh, two, uh, two factors of implication. In countries like Syria and other like similar countries, the country itself controls the GSM operators and whatever method that you're trying to send something towards, they can intercept and they can have access to it. So there should be some I think my colleague had a suggestion. Maybe we could talk about this later. The other thing is also based on the, I think the U.S. sanctions against Syria. Sy Syrians are blocked from accessing essential and important, oh sorry, essential and important things that we can get from Google because of these laws. Example: If we go to download Google Chrome, they would say it's blocked in your country. If we need to update our Android phones, it will be blocked in your country. If we need to download some. And maybe to protect our online privacy, it will also say that it's blocked in your country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe we can uh, collect two or three uh, questions um, mentioning this kind of problem. And this is a very uh, practical problem uh, uh, that we, yeah, please. If this is, uh, we will have a second uh, round of uh, questions on proposals, but if you, if you have a uh, uh, practical problem identified, please go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Nikhat and I'm from Pakistan. I work for Digital Rights Foundation. I have two questions from Google. First, what was your response when Pakistani government asked you to block content on YouTube? Uh, second, what was the process you guys followed to block content in other Islamic countries uh, as a result of activity just there? Uh, YouTube is uh, blocked. seems to be the, the evil. I won't say if I agree or disagree or that, but at the same time as being the evil, you are the, the most desired, you know, <laughs> as I can hear that. Any, uh, can we have a, a third question, maybe on specific problem? Yes. Okay. Uh, Valentina from Bosnia. One question more for Google as a user. Uh, it's the second level. about the second level protection. I'm travel, and yesterday I received a nice uh, email the same. We uh, decided not to allow connecting on the internet because we wanted to make sure that uh, it's you and not someone else. You know, I'm traveling, and you are supposed not to know that I'm traveling, but you know, and I cannot access the first time, and uh, if it's me, then I don't need to do, but you, you forbid me first time. If I wasn't me, what to do? So don't protect me before I ask you to protect me. I think it's a basic human right. Thank you very much, Valentina, because uh, uh, in, in Google's discourse, and uh, uh, don't take me bad, but in Google discourse, what you presented is uh, a lot of marvelous tools to protect the Google users from surveillance but I haven't heard anything to protect the user from Google and from uh, uh, the other companies that uh, Google has contract with. And I would like to add to Valentina's question, uh, the que or a very simple question on whether uh, Google is ready to implement a very, very simple mean as the do not track um, feature on, on his services. Any other question uh, in the same uh, way? Not, not, 
not to direct it at Google necessarily, but in particular problems that you have identified. Is this this kind of question? Yeah, this. is uh, Alia. I'm a social activist from Lebanon. So uh, as uh, Matthias mentioned, if uh, we ask any anyone uh, in the street, uh, do you know where your data is uh, is going or uh, what uh, Facebook or Google or, uh, or any else uh, uh, website do with this data, they uh, may not know. So my uh, question is, uh, in, uh, in what uh, situation Google may give uh, So the, the, I will give the floor to the evil, I think it's uh, obvious, and please uh, answer this question on uh, the relation to the government, how you give data or you participate to surveillance, and also with respect to uh, uh, the company, what do you do with the data and uh, why do you keep uh, our personal data even if we want to uh, to leave Google, for instance. But before that, by the way, I have heard in one of the questions the word blasphemy. And uh, I w maybe it's not the issue, but uh, uh, this issue came back with the, the movie, you know, Sasa of Muslim, and there is a real threat uh, now that many countries want to. Um, have the blasphemy or the defamation of religion, as they say, recognized um, uh, by the international institution, and that. So we should we should be careful when we use word because we uh, it's kind of banalizing this uh, this word. So the evil, please answer. Yeah, thanks, Mayim. You know I'm not evil, by the way. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> Just kidding. So I would, would like to combine the two questions on the two factors in identification because I think they are, they are quite similar. So again, we don't believe that one single tool uh, is uh, uh, solving all the issues. So for example, I was talking about the two factors in identification plus uh, the uh, secure uh, connection. Together, these two tools uh, can, in combination with the knowledge and how to use uh, and how to, 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 how to know about the risk that in some countries, uh, internet users are, are especially internet users are active in the political life, are running, can improve the situation. For sure, in order to improve the situation, we need uh, to create uh, some kind of pattern which can raise uh, the necessity of the second factor identification, especially if you choose to not uh, uh, input the second factor identification every, every time you log into your, your Gmail. One of the factors is uh, connecting from an IP location which is uh, uh, not uh, the usual one.
for example, uh, we are very transparent about the fact that we are collecting IP location is useful for the services that we are providing for our user and is useful also to protect their privacy and their security. Uh, every uh, Gmail user can access to the list of the location, to the IP location that the, from, from which they access uh, to their access the into their Gmail account in the in the, in, in the past month. So again, uh, informing the user that this is important for allow them to to, to, to have control over their Gmail address. Uh, this is um, something that we believe it's it's useful and uh, probably if uh, it's uh, perceived as uh, as uh, as uh, something not correct is because we didn't have done a good job in communicating around uh, this tool. Uh, on the block, uh, block the assets from, from uh, because of the US law, we are uh, working on that. So we were able to uh, have some progress in some countries, and some other countries uh, we have uh, uh, not uh, yet uh, finalized um, our, our, our uh, will, which is uh, to provide access to our tools in across all the globe. So if there are laws and restrictions that are not allowing us to do that, uh, is because uh, our existing uh, uh, rules and existing rules should be challenged. We are ready to challenge the rules. We, we are not uh, uh, breaking the law. But this does not mean that we are uh, OK with the status quo. And we really would love to offer all our services to all the, all the, all the users across the world. Around the, the, the situation in Pakistan, um, and not only in Pakistan, we touched about uh, you know how we deal with content. Uh, we want. I want to be clear on two things. First, uh, we want uh, our approach towards content online is uh, to let the content flow. It, this is uh, across all the globe in all the different situation. Our first, uh, uh, our first uh, goal is to allow the user to express their opinion online, and uh, at the same time to have a variety of different opinion in order to access to content online and form their own opinion. This means that, that in case we are challenging some jurisdiction about the content which is not illegal and is uh, not against our terms of services, we resist as much as we can, uh, and uh, in in all uh, the possible uh, in all the possible way. Which means that we can run the risk that our services are blocked in some jurisdiction. Again, this does not uh, also uh, this uh, open, uh, never-ending discussion with uh, with the governments. We are very open uh, to discuss uh, with the with the governments, but we are not open in order to take a step back uh, in relation to our position on freedom of expression. Uh, we hope to solve the situation soon, but it's important to stress that this situation is created by the, uh, the our choice, which is to let the content flow. On the way, we dealt with the. the sense of Muslim video uh, it's uh, it's in all the newspapers uh, we we took uh, initially a position to take down uh, the video in uh, specific uh, um, jurisdiction and countries uh, in particular in Libya because of the events that was happening we know that is this is not a, a easy job we are not uh, in the position to say look we found all the solution the way Google uh, is uh, is dealing with uh, these issues is uh, uh, the only way uh, when we have a lot of doubts, we have a lot of discussion internally. We try to stick with the rule of law as much as we can, taking in consideration that not always this helps because in some jurisdictions the rule of law is uh, clearly used or abused in order to take down content that is not uh, uh, considered uh, friendly for the local governments. Uh, again, it's not uh, uh, solved. This is why we are engaging with the Global Network Initiative. This is why we are engaging with the Council of Europe in discussing about media pluralism, access to information, improving uh, human rights. So on that, uh, we respect the law. Again, with the cover that I made before, we have uh, uh, terms of services uh, uh, that are clear and easy to read and, and uh, are very straightforward for what concerns hate speech. At the same time, our first uh, goal is to let the content flow. Going on on the, the privacy discussion, I would really like to, to again, make, make clear that we want to provide the user choice. Uh, and again, do the user have alternatives? Yes. First of all, they can use, for example, the search in an in, in anonymized way, which means that, that any no, no data are collected. They, they can choose to not have, uh, uh, for example, any kind of uh, uh, collection of their data in relation to, uh, to the use of the internet. Yes, they can. But the, again, 
go into the what Google wants to do. What Google wants to provide useful services to the users. We don't want to force the user to use our services. We do want to know to uh, something about the the, the 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 users that goes over providing to them useful services. And I think I touch uh, all of uh, of the topics. Uh, and uh, in case I didn't, I'm here uh, for four days. So grab me and I will do it. Yeah, Michael, you wanted very quickly, please. Yeah, um, <coughs> just to expand on, on what uh, you're from Syria said, um, I heard this morning that um, Azerbaijan is launching the first satellite, and I guess satellites is one remedy against uh, blocking ho whole countries. You just then need to access the satellite, which cannot be controlled because it's uh, broadcasting waves. Um, and the, uh, you have to, to, to look for a way to get connection to those kind of satellites and then you're off the game. Uh, what YouTube and, and, and the uh, um, blocking of, of certain information from YouTube, we have this in Germany as well, um, that a couple of uh, music songs are blocked from YouTube. Um, there is a, a hint on the internet and on how to overcome this blocking. Um, so, because it's uh, IP address based, it's based on the internet address you are connected to, and there are ways to get a different address. So, the target system, in, in this case YouTube, does not recognize where you are from, and you get all the content which. Uh, you know, you would like to have. So check the internet again. And the final, final word before you cut me off, uh, there are a lot of requests to internet service providers on, on doing additional stuff or on, on, and Google is an internet service provider as well. You should al always have in mind that whatever is developed to protect users, to help users, um, uh, whatever is developed might be abused to block, to filter, or to hinder <coughs> people in other areas. The dual use of, of software, which helps on one side and which is evil on the other side, is so close together you can't see the distance. Thank you. I, I, I hope we will not do it drift to a very re religious conversation. Let me give this, the floor very quickly to um, John. Thank you. I just wanted to briefly respond to the, the questions that have come up. I think, I think this uh, discussion here um, really exemplifies the crisis of confidence I referred to earlier around um, you know, multi-stakeholder discussions of human rights. I mean, we are at an IGF. Uh, we are talking about the importance of multi-stakeholder responses to internet-related public policy issues, and we have real difficulty in practice about having civil society voices um, on the ground in countries to negotiate and deal with remedies for human rights violations. I mean, where is the opportunity for civil society input into blocking an entire platform in a country for more than a month? I mean, uh, you know, it's it's, I understand the difficulties that um, you know, international corporations have, but I think if we're to, to really respect and live um, multi-stakeholder uh, in practice, then we need to build that in. And a, another example, I think, about needing to be sensitive is that ICANN, for example, has just announced that it will put the four its 14th regional root server in Azerbaijan. And you know, that's great for Azerbaijan, but we're also very aware that there are sensitivities in Azerbaijan around freedom of expression online. Um, and the situation for, for individual activists here. So I think you know the, what we're stressing here is really the importance of having civil society voices in that process as equals in negotiating remedies for rights violations. Thank you. Speaking of uh, remedies, we have uh, uh, five minutes left. So I would like to give the floor for next question, but please try to address the remedies part, how we can imagine new, new forms of uh, remedy. Uh, I think I have Rolf um, Weber, then Thomas, then you. Where's the mic? Can we have the mic? Oh, okay. well, uh, thank you very much. 
I think uh, if I may uh, uh, go ba back to a remark uh, which uh, has been made at the beginning uh, by Wolfgang, probably we are discussing now on different levels. We have the blocking problem, which is of course a very important problem, but we also do have all the problems related uh, to the terms of service, and I would like to address the second one in particular in connection with the remedies. Um, in fact, uh, there are uh, remedies, there are civil law remedies uh, in many uh, jurisdictions, there are competition law remedies. I agree that so far civil society is probably not uh, organized in a very well established way, but that's a possibility which uh, can be achieved, and insofar probably the expert group of the Council of uh, Europe would have to build bridges to those people who are really discussing possibilities uh, to organize civil society in uh, legal actions. And there are many initiatives uh, at the moment taken in uh, Europe. I agree that most likely we come to an imbalance uh, between uh, Europe and less developed countries can probably not avoid uh, that, but I do not think uh, that, sh that we should stop improving youth situation in Europe just uh, because in other countries it's more difficult. I'm very much linked to East Asia. I know the situation in East Asia, but I think if Europe has done something, it could then afterwards influence civil society in other countries. Thank you. Thomas, maybe? works. Now this one is working. Um, I, I don't have a question to Marco from uh, Google for, uh, for a change. Um, I'm Thomas Schneider from the Swiss government and I happen to be the vice chair of this expert group at the Council of Europe that is supposed to develop a tool that helps citizens to uh, uh, better enjoy their rights online. And we have started with some reflections on how to do that and it's not very easy. So actually I would have been uh, unfortunately, the time is almost over. I would have been interested to know from, from you, from the people, from the users and experts, what you would expect, what, it, what is a useful tool on how to translate human rights or your rights that you have in the traditional world. What would you need? What would users need that would help them to know what their rights are on the internet? How should such a, a tool look like? Thank you. And uh, the last question, yeah, please.
that somebody in Google sits and puts a statement against but Azerbaijan. But there should be a way how the we, for example, could uh, send a message to Google as an official body, I mean, uh, saying that uh, on the name or geographic name of Azerbaijan was distorted and there was a uh, statement how we, against the territorial integrity. Thank you. Uh, I confess uh, I find this a very creative way of making uh, politics and being and uh, making uh, activists. Maybe we we will have uh, uh, an answer from uh, from Google. Maybe also you can discuss over the coffee break because we are uh, beyond the <laughs> the end time of the session. And I would like to give the floor. May really two minutes to each one of our panelists just to wrap up and a bit of summary. Thank you. Please, Marco, could you? But yes, I agree. It's better to, to address this issue during the, the coffee break. We know how sensitive it is. Uh, we are respectful of the local sensitivities. Uh, we don't want to mix the two levels of uh, the, the geographical denomination, which is something that you have raised uh, as an issue. And we are aware of this issue because you already communicated to us. Uh, and uh, the way the user can interact uh, with the maps, creating their own maps, and this is a user-generated content. If you believe that this is not uh, okay, you just need uh, to refer it to us and then uh, accordingly to the law, the, to the terms of services, but again, respecting the, the freedom of expression, we'll, we will uh, take action. Uh, on, the, on, on the discussion overall, I found it extremely important and interesting. We took a lot of feedback. Uh, again, we don't believe that uh, internet service providers should be like um, uh, do, poli do, do their policy in a vacuum. Uh, take, th let's take, for example, the anonymity uh, on G+. In the first moment, we say that on G+, we were applying a real, strict real name policies. We change our policies because of the feedback that we received from the civil society and because we wanted to really provide a powerful tool for, for users to communicate. So if they believe that this can, uh, the real name policy can represent a risk for their, for their uh, for their identity, real identity, we, 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 we took action and we changed our policy. This means that a lot of the issues that we discussed today, today are open for us and we are very happy to receive feedback and to discuss uh, about them. Um, <clears throat> well, I know that the um, internet and its technology is still too technical for uh, most of the users. It's too complicated. <clears throat> And uh, therefore, I think it's it's hard to find remedies because uh, um, the user cannot really express. Uh, he, he can, the user can say what what uh, what he or she doesn't like on the internet, but uh, giving a real uh, uh, complaint so it can be solved technically is in most cases at this stage not possible. So. What I think is it also needs a little bit of more time, more education, and this is something for all stakeholders uh, uh, to put into, uh, to educate people on the uh, how to use the internet, the uh, pros and cons. There are a lot of obstacles still in the internet which we haven't even touched uh, today, or couldn't touch today, uh, where users just don't know uh, how dangerous it sometimes is but still think on the 99% good things which the internet brings along, and then you're on a good side. Thank you. I will use uh, my two minutes for an advertisement, not for the government, but the organization that I'm very much linked to for many years. It's the Council of Europe. As you have heard, first of all, Council of Europe, the special uh, experts group, working on a compendium which is very much uh, endorsed these initiatives by the committee of ministers but what i want to say is there has happened and to all of you either you are from europe or you're outside of europe it's really worth looking on the work of the council of europe especially also on the situation of users uh, in the internet field um, there are already instruments about filtering, about blocking, about children on the internet, what happens to the data of children and so on. What is the problem with all these instruments? These instruments are not binding, they are a kind of soft law. But, and please remember that, and that's my advertisement, they were signed by 47 member states of the Council of Europe. 
So if you are, for example, uh, a citizen of a member state of the Council of Europe and are maybe a journalist or a critical commentator, go to your governments and say your government or your minister has signed this confession, for example, uh, in the Council of Europe's work. It will not help that, for example, uh, critics will be still driven down and, and sometimes journalists will be put to, go to prison. But nonetheless, the more you refer to the standards of the Council of Europe, the more helpful it will be. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, in the Council of Europe, it's often said uh, that we have to preserve the public service value of the Internet. And this is something which goes not only for Europe, which goes for global, global concerns. And I think uh, that the issue of user rights, of remedies, um, are also part of that public service value. Um, that is what has been mentioned today, uh, contributing to the trust and to the confidence uh, into the Internet. And one way uh, to strengthen that, which we have not mentioned yet, uh, but it's obvious, is awareness raising, is digital education also in this sense. Um, and I think there is more to be done in that field. And in that sense, I would also like to end with an invitation uh, for the collaboration. Uh, this committee is still working uh, another year. And uh, we hope uh, that both uh, from users as well as from business as well as from governments, uh, we will have more people to contribute uh, to the work of this committee. Thank you very much. Thanks. A um, couple of practical suggestions. One is, um, can someone please establish an interactive platform for I Got a Remedy, um, where we can all you know, share our case stories of when we got a remedy? Um, and that might help develop uh, some, some practical examples that, that would be useful for the work that Council of Europe's doing. Um, I think case studies are really uh, of actual uh, rights uh, enforcement are, are important uh, and will be useful. Um, and uh, if we are self-promoting, then we do have um, uh, a Human Rights Roundtable on Friday, um, which is looking at um, taking forward human rights discussions within the IGF and what might be useful ways to connect some of these initiatives uh, for example, should there be um, inputs from IGF discussions into these um, processes in some more, f some more sort of formalised way? Um, so, yeah, and I, I think that um, I was feeling that this panel was getting a little um, dry until we started talking about real examples, and suddenly we got very fired up. So um, I'd encourage people to take that, that forward into uh, other sessions. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will surely do. We will... Uh or organize uh, other workshops uh, probably for those of you who are in Europe at next Eurodig in, in Lisbon. But we also, in, inside this group, we also developed a set of uh, questions and uh, we have uh, circulated, disseminated this uh, set of questions. But if you are interested to give your inputs, please come to us, to Alvan and to me uh, at the end of uh, uh, the, the session, just that we, we can uh, uh, send you this, uh, this information. I would like now to um, thank, please join me in thanking all uh, our panelists and uh, special thanks to Elvana Tassi from the Council of Europe, who was the maitre d'oeuvre of this uh, workshop and who is uh, working in, th in this working group representing the Secretary of the Council of Europe. Thanks also to Dixie, who, who is here on behalf of the IA Internet Rights and Principle Coalition. Thank you very much, and let's, let's go on discussing uh, uh, in other settings the same issues. Thank you.
not democratic, but this is very true. And uh, in my in my organization, European Digital Rights, we fight against the European Commission, the European Union, and also with colleagues from the US uh, since uh, September 11th.